He turned sharply in my direction and I saw his twisted face from under his hood. Hi, I'm Martin. I was about 15 years old at the time. For more than half the summer I lived with my grandmother. She was kicking me out. She said there was no point in sitting in a stuffy apartment, so you could get some fresh air and get your strength back. But nevertheless, I could not go out of the yard, so she would not lose me. And so I existed in such a boring environment, trying to find some adventure, despite my grandmother's reproaches. One day in our staircase both of them broke down at once and only the stairs remained in my possession. Grandma couldn't go down them, so I also had to do the grocery shopping. When I went out to get groceries, I heard loud and measured footsteps in the stairwell below. Of course, I had caught someone on the stairs before, but here I immediately realized that I had not met that person. The footsteps were very unconventional evenly, like a slow march, they hit the stairs hard and slowly rose up rustling the floor slightly. All this was accompanied by heavy breathing, sounding as harsh and hoarse as if from an asthmatic choker, and yet as steady as the footsteps echoing over and over again. I thought of a zombie, then I thought of some invalid, but I was instantly interested, running downstairs to get a glimpse of the mysterious stranger. I made a lot of noise on my way down quickly, but the mysterious footsteps were not lost on me. It was the third floor, when in the gap between the staircases I saw a man walking on the first floor. From above he looked like a small adult, dressed in a dark jacket with a hood pulled over his head. He seemed to be slouching a little and yes, he was the one who was pacing so loudly. I hurried over to get a closer look at him. It took me about five seconds to get through two floors, but the strange stranger wasn't on the first floor. I looked in the entryway, and in the courtyard, nothing, not a trace. They had fixed the elevators, but I kept on looking in the stairwell, though I was getting tired of it, just like everything else around me. One evening when I entered the stairwell, I was on my way to the elevator, but suddenly I realized that those heavy footsteps were again sounding in the stairwell. I ran up the stairs in the blink of an eye, hoping to catch up with the owner. After running down five floors, I finally caught up with him. I slowed down, trying to walk as quietly as possible. In addition to his dark jacket, he was also wearing blue-tinged jeans and old, tattered sneakers. His feet stood toe-to-toe -to -toe inward, his body twitching slightly as he stepped. He seemed skinny, and it was strange that he was the one stomping so loudly, and taking into account his heavy breathing, his appearance was a little frightening. I followed him like this all the way to the seventh floor. On the seventh floor, he stopped at the door to the apartments and froze. We were literally a couple of steps apart. Then he turned sharply toward me, and I saw his face from under the hood. It looked like all those creepy pictures they print on cigarette packets, but it was scarier. There seemed to be no skin, just a skull, and it was dark. Maybe it looked that way in the dim light. The lower jaw, however, had skin, for it looked swollen, with flecks of rotten brown. The eyes peeking out of the hole were severely bulging, dried out, and did not seem to blink at least, I don't remember if he blinked even once. The picture was completed by the surprisingly numerous yellow teeth, bent in different directions and sharp in appearance. He was looking straight at me, but he must not have noticed with his half-rotten eyes, for after standing for about 10 seconds the skeleton man turned around and, in the same slow, loud stride, staggered out the door. I stood still until the front door slammed, somewhere deep in the seventh floor. Then I ran like a bullet to my grandmother's apartment, trying to hide my shock. Naturally, I did not sleep that night. My memory kept replaying that ugly face, those horrible teeth and tumors, those dead eyes. And, of course, I begged my grandmother in the morning to tell me about the occupants of the seventh floor. Grandmother suddenly said that it was better for me to leave here, tomorrow she would ask my parents to take me away, because all kinds of bad people had settled in grandmother's yard, and I would be better off with my parents. However, when my grandmother was distracted by the phone, I ducked out of the apartment door and ran up to the seventh floor to take a closer look. I had explored it before when I was looking for a neighbor, but there was nothing remarkable about it. It was just like any other floor, except that they put a door in front of the hallway to the apartments, 
but that was also found on other floors. Then I decided to sneak in. I thought at first I would pick the lock with a pin, like in the movies, but while I was picking it, it began to open by itself, someone was coming out. I hid behind the garbage chute and heard the same heavy footsteps and breathing. I was frightened that a skeleton man had followed me out, so I huddled in the corner as best I could, squeezing my eyes shut, but that was it, he had walked past me, apparently, to the stairs. Nevertheless, I didn't dare come out of hiding until I finally stopped hearing his loud footsteps. When I came out, I suddenly realized that I hadn't heard him close the door. When I got there, I yanked the handle, and yes, the door was open. There, I thought, lucky me. Maybe I was being very stupid, but panting with boredom, these adventures pulled me deeper and deeper into the mystery of the skeleton-like neighbor. It was dark inside, and I opened the door fully to let more of the lobby light in, and stepped inside. It looked like an ordinary hallway, though there was only one door at the end of it. It smelled strongly of smoke. Quietly walking through, I also noticed a map on the wall. It seemed to be a map of our city, with black marks in some places. The door at the end of the hall, fairly shabby, was also unlocked. I opened it just a little bit. The light from the lobby was no longer coming in, so it was hard to see what was behind ITIT it was almost pitch black. I could make out a long corridor with side passages, but it was empty no furniture or other things I could see. The farthest aisle was in complete darkness, but there seemed to be a faint pale light coming from the side aisles, probably from the windows. I don't know how far I would have gone with this curiosity if I hadn't heard a long, heavy sigh behind me. Shuddering, I turned around. Yes, it was that neighbor. How had he come back so quietly without making a sound? Or had I gotten so carried away? His black silhouette was recognizable in the lobby door, and surprisingly the whites of his eyes were contrastingly white in the dark. Not glowing, but pure white, with pupils as black as anything else in that semi-darkness. I was numb and didn't know what to do next. The ominous neighbor was slowly approaching. A hoarse, slow exhale began to grow in the silence. But it wasn't coming from the man in front of me. It was coming from behind me from inside the apartment. It felt cold. I felt dizzy. My eyes were blurry. I couldn't think of anything better to do than to rush toward the neighbor behind me with a loud scream. With my eyes closed I couldn't see where I was running, but I definitely hit something hard and lost consciousness. I woke up at home, with my parents. According to their words, they urgently took me away from my grandmother. When she called and said that I was very bad, I did not regain consciousness. Now I was living with my parents again, at home. But soon I picked up a strange contagion in my finger, it began to hurt a lot, then swollen, festering. At the sight of the pus, spots began to appear, very much like the same ones that my rotten neighbor had. No matter what we did, no matter what we applied, the disease did not go away. Soon we noticed that the dark spots of pus began to spread to the entire hand. The hand was turning black and looked as if it had dried up. I could no longer feel pain in the dried out areas, but it was very painful at the junction with the still healthy skin. There was nothing the doctors could do, the infection was spreading and in the end we decided to take the ultimate measure amputation. I have no left arm. Fortunately, not my right hand, I didn't have to retrain how to write. Since then, however, I haven't visited my grandmother. There was no question of taking me there, and even if I did, I flatly refused, almost to the point of hysteria. As I grew up, I moved away from our city. I don't intend to go back, still afraid of the heavy stomping of feet, which I can hear in everyday life. I. Hope. I. 1. T meet such a stranger again, and I advise you not to. Subscribe to the channel and interesting real stories will always be with you.